clear input and well-defined output. Otherwise, gigo, you know, that's garbage in, garbage out, right? So if you don't have a clear definition, you get junk. If you went up to Google and got to their database and put love and then hit the button, you'd get six million results and it would be all sorts of things. If you're not specific, you get general information. You have to be very specific and very clear. Okay. Um, tight focus requires some knowledge. If you know some physiology and know something about bodies, that'll help. You see, if you happen to know that here's a disease and what that problem is, is that something inside the cell gets twisted. You know, a genetic coupling doesn't work right or something like that. That lets you very specifically focus your intent on healing that particular thing. That will give a whole lot more power to healing that thing than if you just do the general thing, have good health. I'm going to light up your whole body and have good health. That will work generally. But if you want to heal that very specific condition, then you need to know something very specific about it so that you can focus your energy on exactly the spot and what you need to focus on. So it helps to have some information about what you're doing and understand something about the body. Uh, let's see. Tools. Important thing about tools is make them up. Make up your own tools. So we use white light. Heard of light workers, right? A lot of people use white light. Why white light? Because, you know, white hats are good guys, black hats are the bad guys, so the bad stuff's black and the good stuff's white. It's just a metaphor. So that's the typical metaphor, but sometimes other colors at the reverse are more useful. Don't let the tool become a slave. Don't become limited by your tools. You can make the tools any way you want. If you don't like light beams, I like light beams because they remind me of lasers, and I burn things with lasers. But if you like a wand like Tinkerbell had and you want to put fairy dust on it to turn it from black to white, that's a good tool. Fairy dust works just as well as light. It's just... Have it be your own tool. Make it something that you relate to. If you try to use somebody else's tools, you won't be as effective with them as if they're your own tools. And tomorrow we're going to go through a bunch of different tools to give you some experience. All right, uh, the last thing is how do you know when not to interfere? And that's important. What you're doing now is you're changing somebody else's probable future. That's kind of button into their business, right? Button into their life. One, you should have their permission. Two, you should always have their best interest at heart. It's not about you. It has to be about them and helping them. Three, you have to not get in their game. It could be that their illness is something they need. It could be that's going to teach them something. There may be value in that illness, not only to them, but to other people may be learning from that illness. It may be the result of a long life of fear and anxiety that ends up degenerating the body. Well, then the body degenerating is the natural consequence of the life of fear. It's part of the feedback mechanism. So when you go in and start changing future probability for other people, you have to be very gentle. You have to be very caring and you have not to be pushy. Now, some of the ways that you know not to be pushy, if you fix something, if you go in and you turn some black spot white and it's really hard, it resists you, or you turn it white and then you look at it 10 seconds later and it's just the way it was when you started. In other words, it's like fighting back. It's struggling against what you're doing. That's a good sign that you ought to leave it alone. It's there for a reason. There's energy that put it there and it's energy that puts it back. Another thing is that if you go in and there's somebody who, has, who needs that as feedback to learn and you take it away, you're depriving them of that lesson. Typically what they'll do is create something else. You know, so they've got uh, cancer of the liver and you go in and you cure that. Cancer of the liver is gone. Six months later, they have something else. Something nobody expected shows up. It's just as life-threatening. Okay, so you fixed one, but it pops right back out somewhere else because it was meant to be that way. 
And you can fix that too, and it'll probably pop back out of something else. And if you keep interfering like that, then it'll probably be that you won't be able to fix things because you won't be acting responsibility if you keep pressing your will to change somebody else's free will. You see, so I'm, I'm, I'm just cautioning you. Be careful, be gentle, be considerate, and don't push when you get pushed back. Let it go. Sometimes people need their illnesses, so that's important. We don't want to just go in and make people's lives the way we want them to be. That's not the purpose of this. Okay, just a few reasons. This is my last slide today. A few reasons why it might not have worked for you. You may not have gotten them all right. The number one is noise. Constant chatter, analysis, guessing, lack of steady focus. Your mind's bouncing around. You're not focused. That's the number one problem. And that's because it's your intellect, intellect hyphen ego. You want to get it right. You're trying to get it right. You're not sure this is right. This doesn't make any sense. And on and on and on. And left brain people have a hard time with that because that's what they do for a living. They analyze things. They logically process. And to get them to turn that off is difficult. Okay, the... the uh, The idea of, of uh, existing in point consciousness between times, when I said just go rest in the void, if your mind was busy then and flipping around, that was probably also not a very good sign. You should have been able to just go to that void and just hang there blank, just waiting for the next instruction. Weren't thinking about anything, just blank, existing. It's what I call point consciousness. Um, holding all these multiple intents with a steady focus. So now you've got six intents all backed up and you've got all of them. You're holding those intents. You may not have done that real well. Fear, fear of being wrong, not being able to do it, expecting it won't work. Um, Belief, couldn't possibly be this easy. You haven't gone through your your normal rituals. You haven't gone through any process. You know, we haven't relaxed. We haven't gotten to meditation states. We didn't do any other things. Uh, This can't work. It's too easy. Gee, I'm not in any altered state. I'm just sitting here. I'm just, like, I'm just awake sitting here with my eyes shut. You know, nothing's going on. You don't have to be anything other than sitting there with your eyes shut. You don't have to be in a groggy meditation state. It's just focus of your intent. It doesn't require anything other than your ability to focus your intent. Now, that ability to focus your intent does require that you get rid of the noise. This is not a wish. You're putting energy into an intent, and the intent has to be precise, clear, and steady, which means you can't have your mind flying around on other things. You have to be 100% absorbed in what you're doing. Um, The last thing is inability to remain a detached observer. Now, that gets worse if it's somebody you know or if it's yourself. You can do these on yourself, but they're harder. You can do these on your children on your loved ones, but it's harder because it's harder for you to be detached. But once you drop your ego and drop your fear, then it's a lot easier to be detached on anyone. But if you have fear, then that will get in the way. And that usually shows up when you're working on somebody you care about because you have a fear that they have this this problem. Okay. Um, It's not about you. Being a detached observer takes a lot of practice, just like being a good listener. It's not something we normally do. Well, that's it. We've been through it. I hope you uh, picked up some pointers and learned how to do this. And I I would be pleased if those of you who are interested in, in learning how to do this and being good at healing or remote viewing, just practice it. Just do it. There's lots of sick people around. You know, just do it. See what you see. It's best if you don't know what the answer is. If you know what the answer is first, oh, this person has a gallbladder problem, then your intellect is liable to put a black spot somewhere wherever you think the gallbladder is. It's best if you don't know. Then you're not so enticed to get that that ego and that intellect working. But just do it. It won't take you long. It would be my guess. I've worked with lots of different people, and I say if you work at this seriously, which means you do... You know, one or two uh, tries, samples, trying to heal someone, a remote view. If you do just a couple a day and you go then find out, get the evidence, 
Think about the ones you got right. How did you feel? How did you approach it? How was your mind? Keep working on it. And in six months, I'd say you should be pretty effective. You ought to be hitting like a 75% success rate. It doesn't take long, and it's not really all that hard. Make your own tools, tools that suit you and suit your personality. Okay. Use your feeling if you don't see pictures. It doesn't have to be pictures. Makes no difference. It's not about nine o'clock, but if we turn the lights out, we're all quiet. We should be okay. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. But, uh, yeah, well, let's see until we can go. Right when they yeah. come and, and ask us to leave, or, or you know that we have to be out and pinned up by then, you can just tell us when you leave. If you got to go, this would be a good time. And uh, if not, we can stay seated and not lose the question. Ten o'clock sharp. Yeah, we start tomorrow. Okay, just yeah, a second. If you wait for the mic, mic here for if you have questions. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> So, so from what you are saying, you know, from a systems architecture point of view, it's not like in a multi-user system where I, c I have access to my own files and I can manipulate my own files, but not access other files unless uh, explicitly given right. permission to. So, from what you are saying is, I have access to everything. You have access every to everything. And it's up to you to be responsible and how you use it. Now, the system wants to wants everybody to succeed, right? So the system is gonna help you succeed as long as you have the right attitude that's helping you decrease your entropy. You start using it in ways that don't decrease your entropy, like we were mentioning, you know, what you wanna do with your remote viewing is seeing the girls' locker room. You know, what you wanna do with your remote viewing is uh, try, to, try to find, uh, um, you know, gambling numbers or, uh, you know, win, win lotteries, that kind of thing you will find that that kind of irresponsibility will probably make it harder and harder for you to, to access, and you'll get worse at it rather than better because the system won't be wanting to encourage you. Now, you can still learn to do it anyhow. You can, if you practice for years and years, you can eventually force yourself to get reasonably good at these things even though you have a big ego, and a lot of people do that. They practice and practice and practice, and they can get to where they can clear their mind, where they don't have the jabber, where they can focus their intent. The system doesn't help them much, but they can still succeed at it to some extent, even though it's probably limited. At some small range of it, they can get very good at it. You can get so much better, so much quicker, if you're doing it for the right reasons. It's a growth thing. Then the system will help you. Okay, so you have some of, some of that, but just you, you can access anything. Right reasons will be helpful and will make it a lot easier for you if you do. And anybody can access your data, too. If someone wants to look at your health body and wants to look at your spiritual body and wants to do those things, they can do that. Now, if you don't want them to do that and you want to deny that, you can also set that up as an intent. You can set up in your mind an intent, basically, to censor that data to say, I don't want that day to let out, or if somebody comes and looks at my energy body, here's what I want them to see. And you can set up some sort of pattern. And the people who are not really very good and take what they get without very deep probing will be fooled by that. Somebody who knows more what they're doing will not be fooled by that. So you can put some controls on it if you wish. You can decide that you don't want to be connected to such and such a person. Anything that they send to me, any energy comes my way from this person, just reflect it like a mirror. Reflect it back to them. Nobody's home. It's like, don't send the mail. This is your intention about yourself and that person. And mostly you can do that. So you do have, you're not totally naked before you know, the masses. You can do that. But you have to be good enough that you can have that intent and hold it, you see. If you're not good enough to have that intent and hold it, you're not going to do that very well. On the other hand, most people are not good enough to have that intent to, you know, do anything to you that's very serious either. 
So you're all kind of beginners in this thing. You know, well, maybe you're not. Some of you held up your hands that you'd been healing. Some of you are probably quite advanced in it. But a lot of you are beginners. And when people say, well, I'm really worried. Maybe I'll do something I shouldn't. You know, what? maybe I'll try heal somebody and they don't. That worries them. As a beginner and you're just starting this, don't worry about it. Follow your intuition. If your intuition says do it, just go do it. If it's not right, you'll probably be stonewalled and it won't work. You're not that powerful that you're going to run over somebody casually. Now, once you get better at it to where you have a much you know, stronger effect, you have to be more careful. But at the beginning, just go play. You can, another thing you can do is you can counsel somebody. You can talk to someone. If there's someone who's very upset, you can go, basically it's the Vulcan mind meld, right? Where the two minds kind of come together. You can go to that person and you can have conversations with them. And sometimes they'll even hear it word for word, repeat back to you. Other times they just get the sense of it. They might reject it. They might feel like they're being put upon. You have to approach them with this concept that I love you, I care about you, I'm trying to help. Have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? Notice the way this works, you see. Now if you go and say, here's what you need to think. You need to straighten up and stop doing this and make sure you're always home before the curfew, you know, then basically you're going to get pushed back out of my face. It won't work. It has to be something that they see as helpful to them from their perspective. Helpful from them, not from your perspective. If they feel that there's something helpful from their perspective, they'll reach out. They'll connect to the data. They'll listen. So it's up to you to say it in a way that's not you and your will imposed on them, but you're giving them advice and help in ways of seeing a bigger picture. A lot of times that's just it. They get these narrow, narrow vision. They just need a bigger picture. And you can help show that to them. You can't push it down their throat. You can't force it, but you can set it out there and they'll get it. So yes, you could misuse it. You could go tell your boss, give me a raise, give me a raise. That guy, so-and-so, give him your name, is really good and he deserves a raise. And you probably will raise the probability that you'll get a raise doing that. But it's not a moral thing to do. And if you don't do moral things, you won't succeed nearly as well. Yes, somebody have a microphone? Yeah, I have a microphone. Uh, first, thank you on this uh, great intensive day that we have with you. Um, my question is related to sort of um, an arrogance that we see, I see it in myself also, among the people that are dealing with these kind of things and we kind of sometimes get a feeling of knowing more than some others and uh, there is this feeling of, of separation and almost like some sort of supremacy. I mean, it can go on, on, on different levels, um, which is also related to, um, I've heard you talking about that, uh, wh when people start maybe healing and things like that, but they're still really a nasty person. <laughs> Even though they're still like a not a very nice person, they remain to be um, not very pleasant to be around. But they do kind of good things on on some other level, you know, that we might not be able to see. So, do you have um, sort of an advice on how to practice modesty in this in this way? Thank when you. I the very first thing that I said when I was doing the introduction was we talk about levels different degrees of, of uh, evolution. Some of us are more evolved than others, and that's just a fact. But don't ever take that fact as a, some people are better than others. People are just different. So if you are more evolved or less evolved, it doesn't matter, you just wherever you are. All of us are trying to do the best we can with whatever it is we've got. And whatever it is we've got is basically what we've managed to evolve up to this point. That's what we're working with. Okay? And the lessons we get are lessons that are kind of appropriate for where we are. So the first thing to maintain some humility is to realize that you're not better or worse than anybody. You're just different. We don't, uh, you know, we don't look down on children as being inferior adults little adults that are dumb and don't know how to do much. So dumb you have to take care of them all the time. You know, we don't have that negative attitude. They just are what they are. They're kids. We don't expect them to know 
or be certain ways, and that's fine. We don't look at them as inferior little people. They're just kids. We need to do that here. We, you, don't, you need to not look at people as inferior or not as good. They don't know as much as I do. I have all this power because I can heal and I can do all this stuff, and that makes me special, and they're not special. That's just the ego talking. And if you get into that attitude, that will limit you very quickly. It's, uh, it's a good thing to avoid. The other thing is that we're, what we're trying to do is get rid of ego. And if, if your exploration and your seeking actually ends up building up your ego, you are working counterproductively. You're shooting yourself in the foot. You're keeping yourself from your full potential. You still may get enough that you can heal or that you can tell a fortune or you can do things like that, but you're limited. Your growth is uneven and you are retarding your progress by that ego attitude. So because what we're trying to do is drop ego and become love, that's where we're going, right? That's the low entropy. That's the path we're after. You should be aware of yourself. Where is your fear? And where is your ego? Find it. Learn it. Then get rid of it. But first, first step in getting rid of it is recognizing it. Most of us have ego that we have no idea is even ego. Most of us use our intellects to justify what our ego wants. We do something, then we figure out why that was a good thing to do, why everybody should be pleased with it. That's just the way we operate. So I'd say, one, treat everybody as an equal. Everybody deserves your compassion and your help and your love because they're all struggling with whatever they have to deal with the best way they can. Secondly, if you feel and you, you notice ego, you notice uh, some superiority because you have special talents, root it out and get rid of it. It doesn't make you special, it makes you different. And if anything, it makes you more able to give if you have special talents and special gifts that you can use. It makes you more able to give to other people, to teach. The more you know, the better you will be as a teacher. You ought to be helping other people instead of strutting your stuff. So it's, it's a sort of a self-policing thing. So if you really have the right idea and it's not about you, it's about growing up and it's about other people, then you kind of naturally will let your ego go. So I'd say get your focus for anybody who's having you know, these issues. It'd be like get your focus straight on what really what you're trying to do. And you shouldn't really be trying to get power or get advantage or convince yourself that, you know, how good you are or, or how effective you can be. You ought to be learning about getting rid of ego, about, getting, you know, about loving people, caring, compassion, those sorts of things. So if you get focused right, I think the ego and stuff will just begin to go, to go away. But then it's a struggle. We're all struggling you know, with wherever we happen to be. That's where we are, and we're struggling with it. And if you happen to be a very evolved consciousness, your lessons are a lot harder. It's a lot more difficult because more is expected of you. So you're struggling just as hard as the beginner who's faced with a rather trivial choice and they're agonizing over it and they're having all this, this angst and everything else. And you'd say, well, see, that's trivial. You know, I can see the solution to that right away. Well, they can't and they're struggling with it. And here you are, you're at this level and you're struggling with what you have to struggle with. It's just a much harder lesson, but the lessons are very specific to your level. And there's somebody who's that much more above you who've already gone through that is looking at you and saying, oh, well, that's obvious. Well, I know what she needs, you know. So it's just relative. You just work on your own thing. Yes. Hello. First, I would like to thank you very much for coming here, really. Uh, I have a bunch of questions. <laughs> no worries. I'll probably have uh, lots of questions, but I'm going to keep it short. <laughs> I have one that's uh, really important for me now is uh, about uh, different levels of realities and uh, most of the time I experience out of body being in a state of the dream and then just like uh, pulling up really quick to different uh, frames and I'm just wondering because uh, um, uh, from my experience uh, I, s I, um, I get to the conclusion that uh, dreams is like a subset subset of this reality, I believe, I don't know, maybe it is, maybe not, but I was wondering, uh, maybe you have an answer to, answer to this. Uh, uh, when you attend, when I am in my dream, 
is it some uh, how secure that is is there any outside beings when they entrancing entrance this reality also and they uh, interact with me or is my only my interaction a safe environment when I'm only interact with myself from different perspectives or I'm generating everything or is uh, or is a larger reality when I entrance this reality and I get and it's not necessarily what you create but what's created for you mm. often the dreams are given to you as a learning experience you'll be dropped in a in a scenario you know there you are suddenly you know in the in the middle of the woods surrounded by wild animals you know some kind of thing like that and that's it that's your scenario and I'll go interact see what you do how do you handle that and the dream is just it's a vignette it's like a um, I call it a test, you know, it's like a test to see how you're going to do. So you'll be dropped in a situation, there you are, and you're in charge, you know, the boat's sinking, and you're in charge, and nobody will pay any attention to you. And you keep trying, but it's frustration. Or there you are, and it's got this goal to do, and you're trying to do it, and every time you try to do it, something frustrates you and keeps you from doing it. You know, how do you approach that? How do you deal with that frustration? And these dreams aren't just all you making them up. It's often given to you as an experience, as a learning experience. You often can understand what you need to learn with the kinds of dreams you have and the kind of learning opportunities those dreams give you. What you'll find is that when you finally get it, let's say you get over the fear or you learn how to deal with that frustration, dreams are gone. You no longer get those kind of dreams anymore. It moves off to something, something else. But these entities that are in your dreams, let's say the entities that are frustrating you in the dream, those are not other sentient beings. Those are just entities created to frustrate you. That's why dreams can change on a dime. You know, suddenly you're here and you're in something else. Um, it's a, and it's not a sub-reality to this physical reality. It's an entirely different reality. It's just a reality, and it's a reality where we learn. We dream because we grow. It's a... It's a thing. It's like here. We're here interacting like this because of all the traction and specificity we get in this tight rule set that we're in. We get a lot of feedback. In the dream reality, it's not quite that tight a rule set. The rule set's a lot looser. We can fly. You know, We can do things. Things come and go in a flash. We teleport. It's a much looser rule set. But we can do things there that we can't do here. We can go through scenarios there that we can't do here. Because there, if the monster eats you, well, you wake up. Here, if a monster eats you, it's a permanent problem, you see, for this lifetime. So we can deal with monsters there that we can't deal with here. It's, it's different. So the dream reality is a completely different reality. But the point of it, there's several points. There's a physical point in that you need some rest. Okay, and you need, uh, that's why you get sleep cycles. Some of, you're not dreaming all night, you know, you go through cycles and sometimes you're just unconscious and gone. Your body needs that sort of thing. But the dreaming part is another learning lab, a different kind of learning lab where you can learn things in a different way that you can't learn them here. So that's what it amounts to. Yes, yeah, so I'm wondering, is it, is it a bit open source, I would say, right, when something can yeah. enter yeah, outside? You're, you're being given an experience. So that thing that comes in could be just part of the experience, and it can be dressed up in any way. You know, it can be powerful, it can be not. It could be just part of the experience. On the other hand, part of the experience that's given to you could be some other being interacting with you in a particular way. So it could be either one. It's just the experience is what's important to you. Whether another being is involved in the experience or not could be. Now, there's no rule that says it can't be. For the most part, it's... It's something that's kind of orchestrated by the, by the larger consciousness system. Okay. Um, first of all, I would like to thank you uh, as well that you're coming here. And um, you were touching the uh, um, concept of love in your book just very briefly, and you were elaborating here a little bit uh, that with the example of the 10,000 people that are loving and the other 10,000 that are in fear. I was just like wondering, um, do you have any more data supporting that idea? Or is it, I mean, it might just apply to the humans. But how do you know that the concept of love being low entropy is also true in the NPMR or other realities? Or it's, a, it's, a, um, it's a very basic thing. The reason that it's, it is fundamental, you know, the love is a fundamental thing in, in the other reality systems. Now, all reality systems are different. They all have their own 
ways of doing things, but they're all also in the same game we are. They're just, they're set up differently. The rules are different. Rule sets can be different. But when it gets down to it, it's basically becoming love, getting rid of fear and ego is the, is the key thing all over. The reason for that is consciousness, the consciousness system, in order to evolve and decrease its entropy, broke itself up into a lot of pieces, right? And these pieces are there to interact with each other. So the fundamental, the, the fundamental situation here is one of groups interacting with each other. Groups and individuals, okay? Individuals and, and groups of individuals interacting with each other. And within that context of interaction of individuated units of consciousness, love is the low entropy choice because that is an interaction that's compassionate, that's caring, that's helpful, that uh, builds up rather than tears down. So it's just a, a fundamental thing. You know, it's not like some places being nice to people, you know, creates trouble and makes everybody run around and go crazy. You know, that uh, they can't stand that and being real mean and hateful and, and uh, full of fear, everybody pulls together and, and you know, works, works well. This doesn't work like that. So it's, that's a universal concept of low entropy uh, is being love because the system we're working in is one of relationship. And that's why here, the most important thing we do here is relationship. It's not what we do. It's not whether we're, we're you know, automobile mechanics or brain surgeons isn't the issue. The issue is how do we interact with people? That's the issue. It's all about relationship. How do we, uh, you, know, you know, how do we care? Is it, is it self-centered? Is it about us? Is it about them? How do, that's where the rubber meets the road. That's the most important stuff. Now, we can read books, and we can study things, and we can meditate. There's a lot of other things that are helpful. But when it gets right down to it, the best teachers we have are each other and interacting with, with each other. How do we make the choices in our relationship? That's a very ripe area. For, for learning. So it's about the whole thing, the whole idea, the whole concept of consciousness and us as individuated units of consciousness is about relationship. And relationships are more profitable for everyone if they are based on caring than if they're based on fear. So it's just, just fundamental. Hi, like everybody, I'd like to thank you. It's been a fantastic day. Um, I've learned a lot, and no doubt I'll learn an awful lot more tomorrow. I'm totally new, new to all of this. Um, one of the obvious questions that obviously comes out a lot of these ses sessions is, you say that death happens and you become a dormant file in the larger consciousness. Is it possible for you to access that dormant file while you're still a live consciousness or them to access you as a consciousness once they're in that dormant state? Yes, you can access that. That's just data in the database. You know, that's, that's data that's available. You can access that and, and uh, now whether that accesses you or not, if it's just data in the database, it probably does not access you because it doesn't have any free will. It's got no initiative. It's just data. You here have free will. You can access it. That's why you can go find out what your past lives were like. You can access that database. But it needs, now it doesn't mean that, let's say we're talking about now what people call an oversoul, a higher self, your individuated unit of consciousness that you know, is now spawning a part of itself in this, in this reality game. So that can also be in a different virtual reality. See, it can be, it can have a free will in some other virtual reality that's maybe more like the dream virtual reality, if you will, one that's unstructured. And from that vantage point, yes, then it can contact you, you can contact it because you both have free will, you both are, you know, are active with your intent. Okay? So there's nothing to say that that, that larger, that, uh, what are we going to call it, that oversoul or that higher self or whatever, there's nothing to say that that can't also be in another virtual reality. There's nothing to say that it can't have more than one of its pieces in this vir virtual reality. You can have one, or, it may have one or two or three free will awareness units here. 
Maybe they know each other, maybe they don't. They may be on opposite sides of the planet or they may marry each other or they may be your son or your daughter. Maybe your same comes from your same self. It just depends whether that is a configuration that is optimal for everybody's growth. There's very few things that can't happen. Basically, the system is geared to optimize our opportunities for growth, our potential, and then we have to, we have to actually do it. We have to grab that potential and, and earn it. But it sets us up in some optimal configuration. If what's optimal for you is that you have a higher self that's also in a virtual reality, so the two of you can interact with each other, both with free will, so let's say it helps you, so you have your own, you know, that's, that's your interface, right? That's your interface, then that's the way that works. So if not, so your guide, when that guide bubbles up, that guide comes up with free will. That guide is just a, an expression of the larger consciousness system. So the fact that it goes up in experiences, that's a virtual reality. There's all kinds of virtual realities. If it's experiential, it's a virtual reality. Okay. Okay, we've got two more questions and then... We'll We've got to go basically. before they throw us out. Okay, yeah. we don't want to be bad customers, do we? I have a few questions, but uh, there's not much time, I guess, so uh, maybe one or two of them. If yeah, you there will be quick. lots of time tomorrow. We're going to have two to three hours worth of questions on Sunday. So this is not your last chance for questions. We'll have a whole lot of questions tomorrow. Tomorrow's an easy day. It, it will be so easy compared to this that uh, anything would be easy compared to this. But go ahead, you have two more. Yes, first one is um, a bit of a philosophical question about free will and choice. Mm -hmm. And uh, it concerns, do you really have the choice to cease to exist? That's the first one. No. How do you cease to exist as consciousness? Yes. Cease to exist as a, as a yes, virtual totally. reality player? Do you actually, yes, have that choice? Do you have the free will to do that? Do you have the free will to cease to exist as a virtual reality player? Exactly. Yes, that's called suicide. Do you have no, free no, will not, as a virtual. not to exist as consciousness? No. You're not going to have free will not to exist in the sense that you can say, I just don't want to exist now. Now, what can happen is that if you are unproductive, okay, now think of this. This is a system. The system has a strategy to evolve. In that strategy, it's got parts that it's using in this cycle. If you have some what do they say? If you have some dogs that don't hunt, if you have some uh, investments that aren't earning any, any return, what do you do? You cash them in, right? You let them go. So it is possible that if you are a failure at learning to evolve and have very little potential to turn that around, that you could cease to exist. Basically, you'd cease to exist because you would just remain a data file. You wouldn't be put in a virtual reality given free will for choices because it would be a waste of resources if it's very unlikely that you would produce anything. Matter of fact, it may be more likely that you would de-evolve and create more entropy for the system. So in that case, players with no, with no uh, potential don't get played. You know, if you're playing World of Warcraft and you've got some character there that always loses and never does anything, just stop playing them. So in that sense, you could cease to exist as far as being given free will and put in virtual realities. You would still exist as data. And that's the sense that they say, no, you can't get rid of the data. You don't erase the data out of the database. You're still there as history, even if you're not played. You've been played once at least, you know, you're here. So you're not going yes, to... Yes, in, in some sense, it does sound a bit as though in the absolute sense, you don't have free will though. That's well, you don't have free will in an absolute sense. Free will is not absolute at all. There is no absolute free will. Free will is your ability to make decisions from your decision space. You've got end, decisions in, end choices in your decision space. You get to pick one of them. And like I say, it's not even all the decisions you could pick. There's some things that aren't in your decision space because you don't know about them. Over here is a whole bunch of decisions that are outside of your reality frame. I mean, a bunch of choices. You could make these choices. You could really be nice when that person's rude to you. That's one of your choices, but it's not in your space because being nice after somebody's been rude to you just isn't something you do, you see? So that's not in your decision space. So here's your decision space. You take your choices out of what you've got. As you grow up, your decision space gets bigger and bigger. Your reality that you live in gets bigger and bigger. Eventually, you don't just live in one reality frame. You live and exist and work and play in two or three reality frames. 
So it's a matter of okay. growing. And real quick, quick for the next one, uh, it's something we touched upon in the break. tend to have higher entropy, a lot of ego, a lot of fear? Well, there is a, there is a proclivity that, that uh, what you're seeing is not so much that psychic people tend to do that. That's not true. What it is, is that the psychic people who are really proud of their being psychic and really makes them feel special, and because of that they put out their signs and they strut their stuff and whatever, those are the ones that you look at and say, well, they have a lot of ego. They have a lot of those problems. There's lots of psychic people who never let anybody know that they can do anything like that. That's just their private stuff. They do that. They understand it. They're, they're full of love. They're full of charity. They're full of this. But you'll never know that they're a psychic person because they don't stay up and say, hey, I'm psychic. I can fix people. You know, Give me a dollar or I'll give you a headache. You know, That sort of thing. You don't find... That kind, of, that kind of ego only is there because that's what they're doing. They're putting, out their, you know, they're putting out their banner saying, I'm special, I can do special things, because in part they have that ego that makes them want to attract, you know, look at me. So the ones that, that have the banner says, I'm psychic, I'm special, then they have a higher probability of having ego. That doesn't mean that all of them have ego. Some people, that's, they figure they have talent and they're going to use it for the good for people and the only way they can get people to come is to tell people that they can do this. So I'm not saying they're all like that, but that's why you kind of get that idea. Probably most of the psychic people who have most of the ability and most of the power, you wouldn't know it and they wouldn't tell you even if you asked. Is this private? Matter of fact, the more you know... The more power you have, the more you're able to change things, the less you use it. Eventually, if you're able to change a whole lot of things very easily, you don't change anything. So you outgrow your ability, not your ability, you outgrow your desire to change anything. You see the way it is as just the way it ought to be. The way everything is is perfect just the way it is. Okay, this person's sick, well, that's on their path. They should be sick. It's going to kill them. It's no big deal, you know? So they die, they come back, they do it again. You see, the more you work at that level, the less you get involved in it, and you just see that it's okay. There's no need for you to change anything. It's fine. So the, the people who are best at it are generally don't do anything with it because there's no point. Why should they change anything? You see, if you have ego, then you want to change things to make your life the way you want it. You don't want to be sick. You don't want any of your friends to be sick. You don't want your children to be sick. You want everybody to do the way you want. Your children are going to grow up strong and healthy, and they're not going to be drug addicts, and they're going to have good friends, and you, know, you can kind of force that some in your mind. You can help them do that, and you're taking charge of everything because you know best, and you know how everybody else ought to be, so you're going to help them be that way. You see, that's a lot of ego. Basically, it's, it's not like that. If you have a lot of power, you generally back off. Let everybody be who they are. Let them learn the lessons they have to learn. And if somebody comes up and says, you know, I'd really like you to help heal my mother, if they know about it, you probably say, mm, maybe I'll think about it. But then you go do it anyway. But you don't advertise that you do, and you try not to let that get out, because if it does, then you'll be bombarded with lots and lots of requests that you just assume not fill, because it's mainly serving somebody's ego needs. I, my ego says, I don't want my mom to be sick because I just don't want her to be sick because you know, her death would be a terrible thing. Well, when you know better, you say, mm, you know, that's what happens. People get sick and they die and then they come back and they do something else. Have a, have a good trip, Mom. You know, <laughs> that sort of thing because you know, you know that's okay. You're not saying anything negative. It's all right for people to get sick and die. Sometimes that's their best step. They're ready to go. Sometimes they're dead-ended here. They're just not learning anymore. It's time to leave and, and go start something else. And to keep them here and keep them here because it suits you may not suit them, you see. So that's, that, I think that's the association. The people who strut are just the people you see. The people you don't see are the ones that, that uh, they're not going to strut.
Okay? Are we done? Okay. See you tomorrow.